So the title of this uh, um, panel is Value Creation in the Law. We're just going to talk about what it is we think about law as a career that makes it great, uh, why it is that Shakespeare was wrong, we should first kill all the lawyers. We don't really think that that's true, maybe third, second or third or fourth, but definitely not first. No, I'm kidding about that. Lawyers, uh, law is a great profession no matter how much how many horrible things you, you hear about it. And, we could even speak to why law is seen as such a horrible profession. There are real reasons for that, um, reasons that are not always the fault of the lawyers themselves. But so value creation is part of it. Uh, a bit about uh, how to think about going about a career in law. I gather that everybody here is at least uh, somewhat interested in be being in a career in law. Uh, we're going to speak for maybe 10 minutes apiece, which would eat up about a half hour, probably a little less. We'll see. And then it's all questions from there, from you guys. Feel free to ask questions on anything. I'm going to uh, give precedence to questions that go to the main themes here, which is legal careers, value in law, and then the extent to which objectivism, all three of us are objectivists, have had any kind of an impact, good, bad, or otherwise, on our careers. Um, and, uh, and then if people have questions more broadly about law and we have time, I'm certainly happy to, uh, to answer those. So I'm going to first turn it over to, uh, to Paul, Paul Beard, and uh, okay. go to town. Thank you, Steve. Um, I did have an interesting kind of career path, and as Steve alluded to, um, I so just as a bit of background for those with whom I haven't spoken to yet, I did my undergrad at UCLA Econ and English, and then I went to Cornell Law School in New York. And after that, I actually did join um, a very large law firm in Los Angeles, but just for a couple of years. And the reason why was that very typically in, in large law firms, you don't get the kind of experience that you might otherwise hope to get. Um, that's not true of all law firms, but to the law firm I went to, and the law firm I went to, that was the case. And so I was doing a lot of sort of document review and things that I considered to be kind of un uninteresting. And then an opening came up at Pacific Legal Foundation in Northern California. And uh, I joined that organization for about 12 years. Both IJ and PLF are donor funded. A lot of people have been asking me, how can you represent people for free? They're all donor funded um, organizations, um, funded by individuals who care about individual rights, property rights, individual freedom. Um, and that's where these foundations are able to, to get their money to represent individuals for free in court. And the goal of these organizations is to set precedence in the courts both in individual states and federally across the country. Um, so th the idea is you, you get a very attractive um, litigant to represent who can't afford representation, who, who's suffered some wrongdoing by the government. You take it up through the courts and hopefully procure a good precedent for property rights, economic liberty, whatever it might be. Um, and that way you're able to spread, so to speak, the wealth across your jurisdiction. And that's basically the goal of these organizations. And it's a, it's a very satisfying job um, to, to sue the government for a living. Um, but you know, it, it has its limitations in terms of pay. And pay is a very important thing as you get older and you have a family. And so that's why I made the switch back into private practice to a large law firm, actually based here in, in Atlanta, Alston and Bird. And I joined their environmental and land use practice. And I want to tell you a little bit about that practice as a segue <laughs> to my explanation as to why I think lawyers can provide very important value, um, both to themselves and to society at large. So I, as I said, I work in the environmental land use practice, and basically my role is twofold. I help uh, clients, mostly companies, um, to navigate the permitting process. So for example, if they own land, or if they own a business, or if they own a facility, I help them with their land use permits. Because unfortunately, especially in California, it's very difficult to do what you want with your property. Um, so there are lots of rules and regulations about what you can and cannot do on your property. Uh, ranging from you know, water quality rules to air quality rules to aesthetic rules. Is your development consistent with the community environment? Is it going to pose a, an aesthetic problem to those who pass by your, your house? Is it going to block some view to some uh, to the ocean, for example. So there are lots and lots of rules and regulations for people to navigate to exercise their right to use their property. And so one role that I have is to navigate, help clients navigate that very difficult and expensive process. And the other role I have is, is as a litigator. 
So um, with large developments or projects, like for example, uh, I represent an oil company who's trying to do some refining projects on their properties in California. And as you can imagine, it's very controversial. The communities are up in arms about this expansion. And um, oftentimes, the jurisdiction in question will grant the permit. Yes, you can bring in this new crude oil to refine and produce and all of that. And what happens then is environmental groups get involved and start enforcing all the crazy laws, uh, arguing that the client is not entitled to his permit, to its permit. And that's when we step in and defend the permit in court. Or sometimes it's a different scenario. The government doesn't grant the permit, or the government imposes crazy, extortionate conditions on the permit. We sue to defend the client in court and argue that that permit should have been granted or the condition should not have been um, imposed. So that's sort of a broad sketch of my practice. Um, how, do, how does a practice like that bring value? I'm very passionate about uh, property rights from my time at PLF, but just sort of in, with my experience with Ayn Rand and objectivism, I, I do think it's a, it's a basic fundamental right without which most rights would not exist. And so I'm very passionate about helping clients um, be able to make reasonable use of their property. And that can be the individual who wants to add a garage to his home to the oil refinery who wants to expand its operations. I think there is um, a, re a right to make reasonable use of your property that should be protected. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we have all of these laws and regulations to contend with. So the value that a lawyer like myself brings to the table is I help companies be productive. That's how I see it. I help them uh, achieve their productive ends, whether it's making more oil, which is a very productive, as you may have heard from Alex Epstein. It's an important uh, element of our economy, and I feel like I'm a part of that process and helping that kind of production happen. Or in court, some might think, well, these lawyers, all they do is sue over, or they exploit their clients, and they're suing, and they're making a lot of money. Well, I don't see it that way in, in our area of practice. We're trying to defend the right of these companies to make reasonable use of their properties. And by the way, those things, whether it be you know, helping uh, a company a secure a permit to make reasonable use of its property or defending that company's entitlements in court, those things are nor to my benefit. Because again, I'm helping to create a more productive society. Um, and I think those, that's a very important value that lawyers should take pride in if they're in this area of practice. Now, I will say that there are some lawyers who don't provide any value and destroy values. And I, the organizations that come to mind are the many organizations in California whose business it is to use corrupt and evil laws to prevent production. And um, it's really quite remarkable. I feel I, I was almost uh, somewhat naive when I went into this area of the law as to the extent to which someone, a lawyer, can dedicate themselves to evil. So you have these organizations set up for the specific, explicit purpose, for example, of, um, of making sure that there is no more oil production in California. And they use the litigation process and all of the nasty laws and regulations that shouldn't be on the books to begin with. They use all those laws to subvert uh, the projects that these oil companies come up with. And by the way, contrary to what my, one might hear in the news, the technology is so advanced and um, it's in the interest of the oil companies to engage in the safest, best technologies and practices. But if you, if you just read the news, you would think that you know, they were just interested in polluting their, their communities, where they live and work, by the way. Um, so there are lawyers who are often on the other side of my cases or matters uh, that are, do not provide value. And I think it's important if you're thinking about a career in the law to think carefully about what will your role be in the legal process? Will it be to help clients navigate through bad laws? Will it be, like what I'm doing today, will it be helping to um, strike down bad laws like what IJ and, and Pacific Legal does? Or will it be helping to enforce bad laws? I mean, I, I really do think that those are the three main categories, at least as a practicing attorney. You have to choose which of those categories you want to be in. And uh, of course, um, my commitment to, to property rights and freedom from almost my, the beginning of my career in, in law school has led me in a particular path. And I'm very proud of the path that I've taken. Um, 
I wanted to say a, a, a minute or I wanted to say a few things about how objectivism has helped shape my practice or how, how it's helped me. And I see I'm running a little bit out of time, so I'll just focus on a couple of things. All of you by now, I'm sure, are familiar with the trader principle. Now, that's, I don't think, original to Ayn Rand. Um, I think many economists have, have described the trader principle, and that is that in a, in a free society, individuals are trading for value. While I think many economists have described that process, like Adam Smith, for example, um, I don't know of any other philosopher except Ayn Rand who, is, who has put it in a normative way that, yes, you should, you should see your relationships as trader relationships. And that has, has profoundly affected um, my practice, particularly now that I'm in private practice and I'm out meeting uh, potential clients and trying to attract them to my services, trying to get them to retain our law firm. I think many lawyers would view that sort of as predatory. Um, you, you think sort of as a, of the quintessential ambulance chasing example, right? You're just out to exploit the misery of others. But I see it very much as, and this could be a function of the practice that I'm in, but I see it very much as a trader uh, relationship, that I'm providing them an important value that they should want, and of course I want their money in exchange. And I, I you know, there's no shame in saying that. That's the trade. And I, that has profoundly affected the way I look at relationships. And by the way, not just business relationships, but personal relationships as well. Um, I've learned and, and try to live the principle that every human being is a potential value. And that if I'm going to deal with these human beings, my fellow man, I should expect to provide them a value in exchange for their value. And it's nothing, it's the, it's the only philosophy that I'm aware of that is not predatory in any sense. That doesn't view another human being as prey or, or, or himself as prey. And I think that's a profound way of looking at relationships, not just in the business world, but in the, in the legal world, in the professional world. One last thing. Uh, Ayn Rand's virtues, she, she lists seven sort of non-exclusive virtues, all, all of which stem from the principle, the master principle of rationality, that you should always exercise your reason in your dealings with people or in your life. And one of them is integrity, which is the commitment to your own values, a very important virtue. And it's, again, it flows from this idea of rationality. If you're going to lead a rational life, you have to be committed to your values. Um, and the way that manifests itself that I've noticed over the years in my legal profession is this. As lawyers, in private practice in particular, you all will be encouraged, if you decide to choose that path, to get involved in community affairs, in, in nonprofit organizations, to be out there in the community doing something that's important to you. And I've noticed that by and large, those lawyers who don't really think about these things in the philosophical way that we might, they tend to choose the legal aid societies, or and these legal aid societies, by the way, are, are groups that basically provide free legal services to um, indigent individuals, some of whom deserve it, many of whom don't because they're enforcing, again, bad laws. But lawyers throw themselves into these very attractive organizations without thinking really, well, is it consistent with the values that I, that I hold? Is it consistent with the values that the firm represents? You know, my firm, it's very strange. We're, you know, I have a large practice of environmental land use attorneys in my own practice, and many of them support candidates or causes that are antithetical to the values that they are trying to uphold on behalf of their clients. They're for more regulation. They're for more bad laws. And I often sit in my desk and wonder, how can they possibly see the consistency in what, in what they're advocating in their private lives and what they're doing professionally? And so I think it's important as, we, as you develop professionally to think about the kinds of organizations outside of the law that you'd want to get into, involved with, and make sure that that's consistent. The organizations are consistent with the values that you hold personally and that you represent professionally. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Matt. Thank you for coming. Um, I have taken a different track than most lawyers. Um, from the earliest age, uh, I admired production. I admired heroes. Um, I think one of my earliest heroes was George Washington. And I'd go to the library when I was four or five years old and spend a whole Saturday just digging, just reading his biography and all the other great founders. As I got older, I started admiring business achievement. And I'd go to the library and read about the Carnegies of the world, the Vanderbilts. And there was something, I, before I even came to objectivism, before I began to understand the importance of philosophy, 
something about the good nature of these people, how good they were. How, they saw opportunity, they took advantage of it, nobody else did, and they, they should be rewarded for that. From the earliest days I felt that, and I wanted to find some avenue by which I could associate with those people. Um, not necessarily as the font of the production, but as somebody who could go for the ride. And uh, I, you know, I guess I was around 17, 18 years old, I felt that the law might be a good avenue to do that. I was interested in history, I was interested in ideas. Um, again, this is before I um, we got to meet Ayn Rand, so to speak. And I wanted to find a place where I could develop certain business skills to be able to talk on their level and to contribute something that you know, I could uniquely contribute. And I felt the law was that avenue. And I went to the University of Texas, uh, did a joint degree in law and public affairs. At one point, I thought I was going to be interested in public policy, similar to what Paul has done. Um, but the program I was in kind of disabused me of that because it was more of a um, a set of liberal program wishes, uh, as it turned out, with a lot of uh, highfalutin calculus calculations and so on. Well, that's not reality. I wanted to, to work with businessmen. So after I graduated from law school, I did not want to go to a firm, which is what most attorneys do. I wanted to be in-house exclusively. And the usual track is to first go to a firm, get a bunch of different clients, see how the world works, and then find a client you like or if you're recruited, go to a firm. I didn't want to do that. I really wanted to work from the ground up to understand how business worked. Uh, my first job out of law school was actually a startup in Austin in uh, technology. And a friend of mine from junior high called me up and said, if you don't have a position for a lawyer, we've got about a dozen employees, and um, there's an opportunity to get on the ground floor. And my nature is one, I, I like risk. I'm kind of an entrepreneur in hiding, if you will. And I started out in sales and marketing, worked my way up, um, did a bunch of little bit of biz dev, a little customer service. When the company grew enough, um, which it did pretty quickly, it was a Macintosh clone manufacturer, which was the first one once before Jobs came back. And once the company was big enough, they needed an attorney. I kind of segued into that uh, into that role. And it's an interesting story. You can ask me about it afterwards. But I learned a lot. Uh, we we ultimately failed because Jobs cut off the pipeline and said no more OS licensing. But it was a fascinating story because I got to see what the nature of business is like and what a lawyer can do in a real go-go environment where business, businessmen say, I want to do this and you find me a way to do that. You know, a lot of lawyers um, rightly say, well, here's some obstacles. Unfortunately, the same lawyers will say, you can't do it. I didn't like that because, again, I admired achievement. I want to, to offer counsel that said, do it. Here are the risks, but if you do it, eh, you won't probably won't get caught. Um, if you do get caught, here are some defenses we can bring to bear. So that's been kind of the tack of the track I've taken throughout my career. Currently, I'm with a post-secondary education company, as Steve has mentioned, and I'll briefly mention what we're under attack for. Um, it is literally the hatred of the good for being the good. So I'll echo what you have heard these last few days: uh, the government, on, on the federal and state level believes that for-profit educational institutions are out to build people, that by our nature, we are fraudulent, that we take in people who other, you know, the big state universities won't admit, that we graduate them after two or four years, and we set them out on the street, that we are responsible ultimately for getting them jobs. Not, they ignore the fact, of course, that the economy has been, well, at best, mediocre, uh, more higher, and more, in more effect, uh, horrible. Um, and so we're under attack. Uh, I think Senator Harkin, six, seven years ago, um, Iowa held a hearing which called out for-profit institutions. And from that day, um, we personally, my company has been faced by an attack by the DOJ, Department of Justice, and by the Colorado Attorney General. And I've been fighting the last two to three years um, two entities, governmental entities that explicitly want us out of business. Uh, they shut down one school in our sector in California, Corinthian colleges, just shut them down entirely. And they make no bones about it. They're proud to say, you guys are fraudulent. We converted to nonprofit. They're saying the same thing. They're saying, it's just, you're doing it to hide. There's still somebody, the owner of the company, wants to make money, essentially. And making money is a horrible thing. So I've been fighting that for two years. I can give you more detail if you wish. Um, let me give you just an instance of how objectivism is important 
in my life, and I think for all three of us, in, in effect, words have meaning. And what objectivism makes clear, or has helped me, is if you understand the nature of concept formation and how important it is to deal with concretes and abstractions, as an objectivist, it's easy for me to identify essentials and to communicate it. So, you know, it, you could be a lawyer and say, well, here are some principles, and you deal with the client says, well, I'm facing all these concretes. How do, you know, you're talking all these highfalutin ideas. What I can do, what I've been able to do is say, okay, let me look at the concretes you're facing. Here are some broad principles. Make it clear to them, here's the road you're going to face down the line. Because, you know, business principles want to see long-term thinking. They're so concerned about day-to-day -day activities, they need somebody to help them, advise them on where are things going to be in two years if I head down this road. And by understanding the nature of concept formation, by understanding objectivity, you can essentially persuade, help persuade a business owner, you're doing the right thing, or if you're not, here's some obstacles to address so that you can continue to do what you want and make lots of money. So. So. All right, so let me, I'm going to just uh, use a few minutes to summarize some of the things that uh, both uh, Matt and Paul talked about and kind of draw out some common themes, and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, so a couple things that have come out uh, based on what they've said. One is that you look at law, I think in any capacity, as civil law's purpose is to solve disputes. It's to allow people to trade and create value and keep moving forward, so to speak. And what lawyers do is they help them solve those disputes. Sometimes that means you go to court and you have a rancorous dispute with somebody else. More often what it means is advising your client about a way that what you want to do. If you're a business client, you don't want to go to court. Um, I want to achieve X. How do I achieve it? And Matt just said, you know, I'll sum up what Matt just said in something like, I don't take no for an answer. I don't believe that I can't get from point A to point B. I know there's a way to do that. And I know from the way Paul litigates that he approaches it the same way. If it's in a litigation, I certainly did that when I was in private practice. I didn't accept that there was no way to vindicate my client's rights or put my client in a better position than they, could, they would otherwise have been. And that's a huge challenge. It's hugely fulfilling to do that. So one of the things I learned as a lawyer about myself is I love hard work, right? It sounds kind of weird. It's a good lesson to learn when you're young. I think everybody who is ambitious, who wants to do anything, needs to learn that lesson. Hard work is good. I mean, unless what you're doing is sort of drudgery work that you hate, but there's even a way in which, you know, physical labor can be really satisfying if you do it right. But if it's a job that you think that you like, I can remember walking out of my law firm at you know midnight to 2, 3 a.m. through parking garages when I hadn't slept for hours and hours, you know, hadn't slept in 24 hours at least. And just stopping and thinking to myself, you know, aside from wanting to lay down right in that oil spot and go to sleep, I absolutely love the fact that I am working my ass off because what I'm doing is providing real value in the world. I'm getting to use all of the skills that I've developed, all of the thinking skills, all of the research skills, all of the advocacy skills, the analytical skills, the strategic thinking to try to help this client around whatever these obstacles are. Now, it obviously helps that you like your client, you think he's right, but even when you think your client is making a mistake, then the job is to explain to him, look, there's a better path. Uh, and I think all three of us do that in our careers, and it's one of the things that I would sum up and say, this is part of what the value of a legal career is. You learn skills that are universal skills, communication skills, thinking skills, you know, hardworking skills, research skills, analytical skills, which are invaluable and, are, and, are, uh, and can be used in any type of uh, endeavor. You know, I would describe Matt, he's a lawyer certainly, but he's also a businessman. He's really a little of both. And he could not be as successful as he is if he did not understand the business that he is operating in every bit as well as all of the other business. I would venture to say, and I don't know this to be true, but I'll just take it as a guess, he probably understands it better than most of those guys do. 
Um, and he has to understand it better than those guys do because he's got to be able to think of all of the problems before they happen. Same thing with Paul. In order to, to represent clients well, you have to understand their business. And, uh, and one of the great, really cool things about law is you're constantly thrown into a new area. When I did uh, constitutional law, it was, hey, here's this new issue that's come up. I don't really know anything about this, but I'm going to throw myself into it, and I'm going to learn everything about it. Then I have to learn not only the law, but I have to learn the client's business in order to represent them effectively. That's fun. That's really cool. I often liken law to, now I understand what adrenaline junkies are all about. They, you know, they go out and they do these crazy, they parachute or base jump or just do super crazy stuff for a while. And then like you can imagine that they go home and they're eating breakfast and they're like, oh, this sucks, man. This is totally boring. I got to have, I need more adrenaline. I need another lawsuit. That's how I felt all the time. I'd get home and be like, okay, you know, what am I going to, I got to sue somebody else because life is not fun if I'm not involved in that kind of a battle with somebody. Now that can, there are ways in which that can, you know, drive you nuts, but, but it's, a, it's a good thing ultimately. It's, it's understanding that this is really thrilling work. Um, no matter what you hear about law, law is solving problems for your clients uh, in unique ways. And the best lawyers do what Matt just said, which is, I'll sum it up, is they don't take no for an answer. They, they are based and, and they are convinced there's always a solution. It doesn't mean the solution is going to leap out at you from the case law. It certainly doesn't mean that the judges are going to give you that solution because oftentimes you're working against the judges, one of the things that used to frustrate me. But it does mean there is always a solution if you, and so let me dovetail with, with what I learned about uh, law from objectivism. I could say it in simple, if not simplistic terms, but one of the things I used to remind myself always was A is A. Okay, there's a world out there, it is what it is, and there are ways to find solutions in that world. I just have to find them. The fact that the law is bad is not the end of the world. Why? Because there's a whole, just, okay, what is the law? It's, it's what a bunch of judges have said on something. Is this written in stone? No. Is it absolutely monolithic where all of the avenues of attack have been closed off? No, of course not. People make arguments about unique areas constantly. My job is to figure out where the chinks in the armor are. How can I muster and marshal the facts that my clients uh, offer? How can I take advantage of the media and, and present these people as sympathetic human beings who are getting screwed by the government? How will that help me? How can I tap into other intellectuals out there who might be able to agitate for my cause that could change attitudes enough? Even if I lose the case, what can we then do to change the law? If you look at some of the, the cases that IJ has litigated and PLF, that's happened often. So there's all kinds of things that one can do. So realizing, you know, there's a real world out there. It's mine to kind of mold and fix and attack and see what can be done uh, out of it. That's definitely something that I get from, uh, from objectivism. Another is, is one of the points that Matt raised, which I, I would call a methodolo methodological point. It's just good, clear thinking. Um, I could tell you a lot about how to study in law school. I did very well in law school uh, in large part because I was an objectivist and I knew how to think about organizing material that is not always organized conceptually and well. So what I did was I organized it that way and, and ended up getting good grades. Final point is moral courage. Um, I, and I think that's true for any lawyer. It's definitely true in the kind of thing I did. We were, and, and Paul were both involved in different parts of our career with, with uphill battles that are so uphill they're basically vertical, right? I mean, and most of the people would look at that and be like, what the hell are you challenging these things for? You know, this, this is a dead letter. This one went out during the New Deal. You can't challenge, you know, these laws by invoking property rights or economic rights. It's just not possible. And the organizations that we worked at said, well, we're not taking no for an answer and have made great strides toward that, those goals. And you can, if you read the history of conservative libertarian litigators, you'll see that uh, we made I mean, tremendous, unbelievable strikes to the extent now that there's a whole thing called libertarian constitutionalism, um, which is a real challenge to the kind of monolithic view on both the left and the right. It's generally a good trend, uh, and it comes out of work that literally he and I and a handful of other people, you can count them on a couple hands, did. And it was only because we came at it with the moral courage, and I, I don't know if, you know, I certainly had this when I worked at my from uh, talking to a lot of other people who were always, oh, well, the law's against us, and 
can't really say that to a judge because they'll get mad at us. The response to which is, to hell with that, man. It's, you know, we're right. We are actually right. We're not just right morally. We are right from a historical standpoint. We have a point of view that's entirely consistent with what the founders thought. It's gone out of fashion in the last 70 years, but I'm not gonna let that lay. Why the hell do we let our enemies win this fight? You know, it took them 50 years to get to, to ruin the law. Maybe it'll take us 50 years to get back to fixing the law, but I don't accept that, you know, them ruining the law is just, that's it, game over. Now we just want, waltz forward into the collective, collectivist paradise. So uh, I never gave up and, and not giving up and having the kind of moral courage that you get by being an objectivist was absolutely instrumental. All right, let me cut it off there and uh, we'll open it up for questions for the rest of the time. And um, uh, yeah, so with all of that, there have to be questions. Go ahead. That's a very complicated uh, issue in the law. Um, I would say as if I, were, if, if I were sort of committed to the traditional view of the founding, I think it would be uh, use of your property to the extent that it doesn't interfere with the rightful use of your neighbor's property. So you can't use your property in a way that interferes with your neighbor's right to use their property. And I would even go so far as to say it has to be some kind of a physical injury or harm to the property or their ability to use their property. So for example, I, I don't think that aesthetic aesthetics, even though as a neighbor you may not, may, may not like the color of your neighbor's home, that is not the kind of legal injury that would that should be prohibited. Um, so it would be some kind of physical injury, smokes that you, the traditional examples are smokestacks or pollution going on to your neighbor's property. And there, there's always been traditionally an avenue to, to, to redress that injury, and that's private nuisance law. You take your neighbor to court, you prove the harm, and, and he stops it or compensates your boat. But um, what you see now is our preemptive laws in the name of the public good, where the government just, uh, uh, categorically bans certain kinds of activities on property without any question as to whether there is physical harm, without any need for the uh, allegedly injured parties to prove their harm. So they've, they've by and large done away with a lot of private nuisance law and just codified it as a, a, a total ban on productive use of property. And the effect is not only to violate an individual property owner's rights, but it's also to, uh, to deny the community and everyone the productive use of property, which is a good thing. Um, so does that answer your question? Yeah, and also just to pick up on that, it also takes away private solutions or, or sort of crowds out private solutions to problems like these that would crop up. So gated communities or, or communities that are homeowner association communities can easily solve any of the kinds of problems that homeowners would uh, foresee happening um, in terms of aesthetics and whatnot, just by saying, look, if you buy a home in this community, you are contractually bound to certain aesthetic, you know, aspects of your house or, or treating your property in a particular way. If you want to live in that community, you can. I mean, they're, they're all throughout California. Um, when the government does that, it obviates the need to have that and to solve those problems by individuals, which all of these problems are solvable by individuals, you know, peacefully and in good faith dealing with one another. Um, so on top of everything Paul said, I think, uh, you know, you could easily do away with uh, the laws, certainly zoning laws, um, and, and solve those problems either by private contractual arrangements among property owners or just by having good definitions of what a real encroachment on property is. So Paul mentioned smoke and pollution. The other two I would add are sound and light. There are ways in which you, your property and the enjoyment of your property can be inhibited by really loud sustained noises and light. If somebody takes one of those spotlights and shines it right into your living room door. But that's a measurable phenomenon. You could say, look, turn the light off, you know, uh, don't, don't point it right at my window, keep the sound level down below a certain uh, decibels, and there are, there are court cases on this. So all of these things are sol solvable, and it's, it's a real myth that's grown up in the 20th century that without affirmative government law and without regulation establishing how everybody uses their property, there'd be total chaos. That's utter nonsense. It wasn't the case in the 19th century and in the early 20th century. And it isn't the case in Houston. I and, oh, that's not the case in Houston where they don't have zoning. 
Uh, and it's not the case in many homeowners associations where people willingly choose to live um, uh, so they can live you know, in a community that aesthetically looks like they want it to look and follow certain rules. Yeah. And I'm, I'm from Houston, and you avoid blight. I mean, there are sections of Houston that are not great, um, but because there's no zoning, you can have an area five years later, it's unrecognizable. It turns into mixed use, and it becomes commercial that quickly. Yeah. So you've got that level of economic right. development that actually has helped the United States in the last few years, because Houston has been one of the areas that has really uh, done well. Um, and there's m relative more freedom in that area. You're talking to me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. What's your view on uh, the Constitution sanctioned uh, in the domain? Uh, my view is that it's a horrible mistake in the Constitution. I wish it wasn't there. It really is. Uh, so you're talking about the takings clause. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's been litigated in recent years by the Institute for Justice on the grounds that, uh, or the, the, the argument was that uh, land can't be taken so the takings clause reads, nor shall land be taken for public use without just compensation. So two conditions, just compensation to the, to the owner that's being taken, and it has to be taken for a public use. Now, predictably, that's been expanded really to mean public benefit, which ultimately means anything. Uh, and and the, 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 the sort of height of, of the destruction of that provision is the Kelo case, which sanctioned the taking of land for... Uh, from one private owner to give it to another. Um, and that's a horrible decision. I would go more fundamental and criticize the takings clause as such. I think it's a mistake. It's one of those provisions. There's a handful in the Constitution that I wish the founders didn't include. Historically, I understood why they do it, did it. Um, I'm very sympathetic to why they did it. They were operating at a time when it was seen as necessary for the government to have the power to take land in order for things like public roads and schools and really government buildings and that kind of thing. Uh, I don't think they understood quite what we do today, certainly not what objectivists do about the nature of government power and the ability of private parties to solve those kinds of problems. It would have taken a whole lot of foresight for them to read that out of the Constitution, so I'm not surprised. Um, but I think inevitably that power will be abused. So. You can, uh, the, in the news lately is, is Donald Trump's use of the power of eminent domain to take uh, Vera Koken's house in, uh, in Atlantic City. Um, a lot of people criticize him for being a bully to her for you know, taking the, the land for a casino parking lot. Yes, true. I would say it's inevitable if that power exists that you're going to get bullies like Trump, cronies, really. Um, because what the hell does a public use even mean? And it's inevit inevitable that it's going to be broadened to mean public benefit. So... It was a mistake. It was an understandable mistake. I think, from what I understand, the founders viewed the power of eminent domain as the despotic power. They were concerned about it. They did limit it uh, in two ways, which was before, so in England, it was the king can take your property when the king wants your property. And that's just it. You just lose your property, and the king can use it for any purpose he wants. Founders imposed just compensation, which is gigantically important, and then the public use. Um, both of these uh, restrictions have been diluted over time so that you don't really get just compensation today. Uh, the, deck, the deck is really stacked against the landowner. Um, so I'm against it. I mean, it's not going away anytime soon, but I never hesitate to argue against it and to point the finger when we're talking about abuses of eminent domain or cronyism as the power as the fundamental problem <clears throat> and not so much how the power is being used it's so vague, it has, it has inevitably to be used in a, in a bad way. Josh. Um, well, I was in the president of the room one day in about a three-year long, and so I kind of wanted to pitch this question to maybe other people. Um, what, what are some key considerations that you were excluded in our know, particular town before going into this three-year long? And just for everybody. Yeah. One thing I like to mention, life is about integration. And what the law affords is the ability to integrate a lot of disparate things. And I mentioned my background, you know, getting an idea of business functions. I can, if you go to law school and you apply legal reasoning, you can graduate not only as an attorney who can work for a firm or you know, for um, a business or a public interest firm. Over time, if you want, you can become a CEO. 
You can become a CFO. You can become a COO. You can get down and go in the field, sell. You can get into any, any myriad of businesses because the law teaches you the importance of connection. And I think that's critical. And it's a great skill to learn. In, in, in law school, it's really distilled. In order to succeed, you really have to put things together and, and, and distinguish cases and precedent and facts. And it's a great skill to learn. So for me, it was a, stop, a, a jumping point, not just for my legal career, but I have other interests as well. It was a non-legal variety. And I think, believe I'm in a great position to take advantage of that. Yeah, here's what I would say. Um, first, ask yourself why you want to uh, go to law school. That's a key question. And the way, what I did, so I took four years off um, between college and law school, and I worked, and I had this vague idea that I might want to go to law school. And I was lucky enough to be working in um, a developer. I worked for a property developer and land owner, and he sent me landlord tenant court constantly because he didn't want to get yelled at by all the tenants and the judges, so he sent this you know, hapless 22-year-old who didn't know what he was getting into. Uh, it was terrifying, but it was also pretty cool and fun. And I worked with the lawyers. Now, the key point there is I saw what lawyers did on a daily basis, and I thought that would be cool. I would like to do that. I would like to do the kind of ground level work that these guys do. I like writing. I like researching. I like speaking. I would ultimately like to go to court. Um, so the first question to ask yourself is not, what is my vision of law from the standpoint of like the big picture when I think of Atticus Finch or, you know, the characters in Scott Turow's novels or John Grisham's novels or, or what mom and dad think of as law, which is it's almost as good as medicine. You know what I mean? It's, it's, a, <laughs> it's a professional career and I want my kids to be professional. You should think about what does it mean? What am I going to be doing on a daily basis? Uh, and will I enjoy doing that? Now, obviously, do I have a passion to do this kind of work long term? Do I have a vision of this that fits me? I would I see myself as an architect. I see myself as an advocate in court. That matters too. But many, many people make the mistake of looking at law. They see Atticus Finch or some other great lawyer that they've heard about. They think, I want to do justice. Uh, but they never realize, yeah, but the thing is, I hate writing, I hate communicating on my feet, research bores me, I don't like slogging through documents, and you're looking up statutes is boring and reading cases. Don't be a lawyer, because that's what being a lawyer is. So there has to be a marriage between the actual things you do and then the bigger applications of it. There is a period of time that you go through where you have to learn the skills. That's true of anything you're going to do. If you hate that, I would advise you don't go to law school. So the best thing I, I can say is work around lawyers or interview lawyers and get a real sense of what lawyers do. Uh, and if you really like the skills, the daily activities that they undertake, uh, and uh, you can stand doing that work because it's a means to the end of gaining those skills so to the point where you can be the senior guy who is really using them in a way in a few years uh, that will be really satisfactory then law might be uh, a, good, uh, a good place for you to go. Um, today's world, you have to consider cost. <clears throat> it's so expensive to go to law school. Um, it's, you know, you come out with hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt. I came out with 100 grand in debt. Uh, and I was able to pay it off relatively easy because that was the late 90s. And, you know, all of the, there were tons of lawyers who were going west to do startups. And they were throwing money at us. Every week I got another bonus. We just accumulated so much money. It was like, this is unbelievable. Let's just, and I paid all of my, mine and my wife's debts off in a couple years. Um, so I came, I merged from that experience of working for a big law firm completely debt free. I'm not sure it's able to, you're able to do that anymore. I think it's a hell of a lot harder to do. It may be impossible to do, given the level, the debt load, given the, the likelihood of getting firm jobs that will pay that much. So you really need to think hard about this. Uh, we said before there's always a way around many different things. So think creatively. Um, think, you know, what if I go to a state school that's a lot cheaper? Uh, what if I go to a lower ranked school and get a scholarship even though I could get into a higher ranked school? These are all options. These are things you should be thinking about. But definitely consider cost. Final point I'll say is if you're really serious about law school, um, you have to be serious about getting into the best law school you can and giving yourself those opportunities. The two things that matter are grades and LSATs. 
That's really it. It's all about grades and LSATs. People will say your essay and your extracurricular, nah, blah, it's all nonsense. It's grades and it's LSATs. Get good grades, do well on the LSATs. I made a huge mistake not taking an LSAT prep course. I did okay on the LSATs. In retrospect, and I was like, oh, I don't want to spend $1,000. And back, I'm like, you idiot, why, you know, spend $1,000, it would have made a world of difference if only you would spend that money. Uh, so do it, take the class, do as well on the LSATs as you can, good, good grades, um, and you'll set yourself up for getting in the best law school possible, or at least uh, widening and broadening your, your, your options. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. You had a question. Yeah, um, this is to Paul, I'm one of the students on the class as well. Um, there are schools that give grades that are really high and they don't Uh, let me start with the second question. Um, so I mentioned the legal aid societies, and I don't want to put them all in the same category. It's, it's a sort of general term. And there are lots and lots of legal aid societies, both at a city level, state level. I think there's probably a federal one, too. Generally, um, their mission is to help indigent people with their problems. So whether it be landlord, tenant, law, bankruptcy, um, I guess it would be contract, general contract law. Um, debt issues, debtor collection issues. And I have found that a lot of those legal aid societies focus on enforcing laws that I don't agree with, um, or, or even enforcing them in a way that I don't agree with, even if I agree with the, the law. So um, that's why I said if you're, if you're an objectivist um, and you have a certain view of laws and what kinds of laws should be enforced, you may not, the, le the typical legal aid society may not be the kind of organization you want to get involved in because of that. Um, you know, I, I have, I've never known of a legal aid society that represents landlords, even though many landlords, they're not wealthy. I mean, they, they may own like a property or maybe they rent the next, their, a room in their home or something. Um, and, uh, and I know that because we represented a lot of landlords at Pacific Legal Foundation who couldn't afford free representation. So, but these legal aid societies won't go there. They're, they're, they're kind of an ideolo they have an ideological bent, def definite ideological bent in favor of consumer protection laws, tenant laws, and the kinds of laws that we, we probably wouldn't agree with. So my point in, in that example, though, was to say that you want to be careful about the kinds of organizations you support and affiliate with and make sure that, that, there's, a, that there's a consistency between what you're, you're doing when you're off the clock and professionally. Um, especially if you have clients whose interests you believe in but may conflict with what you're doing off the clock. That was my only point. As your first question, I'm not sure I understood it. Are you saying that these, these repayment plans, are they consistent with objectivism if you take advantage of it? No. Oh. Can we offer some thoughts on that? Yeah. So you got to think about it from the standpoint of what is it that you will actually be doing at this place? Will that be fulfilling in some way to your career or valuable to you in your career? And then finally, are you compromising your principles by doing this specific work? Don't approach it from the standpoint of Legal aid society is bad because it gets government dollars and I therefore shouldn't work there. Approach it from the standpoint, in my view, of what is the type of work I'll be doing? Will it be fulfilling and would I be compromising my principles to, to do that? So there, there are lots of other organizations and I will say I would keep a, uh, I would take a look into what um, organizations are, are qualifying for those sorts of programs. I know Yale has a program like that and a number of other, I think Harvard. Um, my sense is that some of the other organizations, like IJ, are pushing to be 
participants in those programs and that some of the students who go to those schools and have wanted to work for an organization like IJ have pushed them to say, look, you can't say it's okay to work for the ACLU and you get debt uh, relief, but not IJ. They both are essentially doing the same thing. They are both helping people who can't afford to pay um, for their, their own uh, uh, legal representation. Just because you generally favor the leftists, not the libertarians, that's not a good enough reason. I mean, that's just pure discrimination on the basis of people's ideas. And my sense is that it's opening up and that there, there are actually more opportunities. But, but even if they're generally limited to the left, think hard about what that means. So I did pro bono work as a lawyer before I, when I was in private practice for, um, it was some program that appointed lawyers uh, for uh, women who are having family law problems. I mean, you could cast that as some sort of a legal aid thing. I think she was probably on welfare. But she was having a problem uh, with her husband, and it was a domestic dispute about whether uh, she was going to be able to keep her kid. And I looked at the facts, and I talked to her, and I thought, she's right. And I don't give a crap that she's getting welfare. I care about the fact that he, I think her husband is really being really horrible to her. I think she should keep this kid. And I have no problem working with this organization, taking this case, and helping this woman who is in a position uh, of you know, deserving help. The fact that I somehow helped this legal aid program in a kind of general, peripheral, or incidental way is, it was, it was you know, of no interest to me. Um, the, the program exists. I'm not furthering the program. I'm not going to go around and lobby for it. I'm just going to represent this one woman who, who needs and deserves uh, help. Now, that wasn't a loan forgive, forgiveness program, but it was a kind of pro bono program. So you want to really think hard about um, what sorts of, what are you going to be asked to do as a lawyer in this program? Um, and, uh, and does it serve your goals? And are, is there some way in which you're compromising your principles in doing the work that you're doing? I think there are many more opportunities in which you're not compromising your principles. I don't think you are just working for an organization that would otherwise continue without you. Um, unless you're like, unless you're going to fundraisers and raw rawing the organization and saying, yeah, you know, we should take more tax dollars from hardworking Americans and plow it into this organization. Um, so the two points are think hard about what it is you're gaining and whether you're compromising your principles in working for any of these organizations, and then see if these loan forgiveness programs could apply to other types of organizations like IJ or PLF. Um, some of the legal clinics that are cropping up at a lot of law schools are more kind of libertarian legal clinics, clinics that are designed to help uh, budding businessmen, small entrepreneurs who you know simply lack the startup, startup capital and cannot navigate the regulatory system. Sometimes uh, working for one of those would, uh, would qualify. Um, you know, you could think about an organization like FIRE, the Foundation for Individual uh, Rights in Education, might qualify. There are all kinds of groups out there now that could conceivably qualify for some law school's loan forgiveness program. And I think there's really a burgeoning movement. And you, as a law student, say, could even prevail upon your career services people and, and the people who matter and say, look, there's no, absolutely no good reason that you give to only the leftist side people, but not the libertarians. They're all helping you know, the little guy fight the system, so to speak. And there's just no good reason in good conscience that you wouldn't apply it. And you can actually make a difference that way if you start early enough. So keep an open mind about it. Um, uh, and don't just reject it because it's broadly speaking, you know, leftist welfare state stuff. It's often that you can get really good experience and really represent people in a context in which these people are good people, even if the organization is shady in some way, ideologically, the people here that I'm defending, they deserve a good defense, and that I can have a clear conscience on. Are we, are we out of time? Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, thanks uh, very much, and feel free to come talk to us. Thank you.